This is Nursing Uncensored. I'm your host, Adrienne Benning, and I invite you to listen in on conversations I've had with real nurses about the crazy and wonderful lives we lead. This podcast is meant to create laughter in addition to serious discussion, and nothing is off limits. We're always honest, but we're not always safe for work. Please listen responsibly. Welcome to Nursing Uncensored. It's me, Adrienne, creator and host of this show. And today I am welcoming uh, Jamie. Jamie, hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm so great. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, glad to have you. Jamie and I have known each other for a little while. You are the creator and host of the podcast, First Do No Harm, Mm -hmm. which I really love. So this is uh, yet another uh, kind of swap that we're doing uh, on each other's show. So welcome. I'm glad to have you back today. Thank you. And we're actually, we're recording this on election day 2020. It's a really stressful day. And um, initially, I was going to say that I haven't consumed any media about anything at all today. But um, I actually just a little while ago went out and checked out the the count on the election. And, oh, it's so hard not to. Uh, but, you know, I also know that there's going to be a lot of like shit talking and people that are angry regardless mm-hmm. of what happens. And so I'm trying to I'm trying to shield myself a little bit from that today, which, you know, I recognize is a privilege in and of itself to be able to kind of shut that off for a minute and not think about what is otherwise some pretty like mega stuff for many many people in this country and in the spirit uh today of recognizing our privilege we are going to talk about it's a buzzword but i'm going to use it or a buzz phrase but i'm going to use it and we're going to talk about white allyship what it means to be um an ally to uh people of color and disenfranchised and frankly like just abused and murdered populations in this country we're seeing um you know i saw i saw a meme earlier today that said uh people need to stop white people need to stop referring to systemic racism and public murders as all that stuff that's going on in the media so we're here today to try to be um, a part of that ongoing conversation of what are we doing as I mean, for those of you that um, are listening and can't see the video, uh, Jamie and I are both cis hetero white women. I assume you said that you're married. So I assume that all of those labels yes. apply. Yeah. So, um, you know, we don't know everything. We're not going to solve all the problems today, but we are going to get a little bit uncomfortable in talking about uh, the work that we've been doing and continue to do because it's not it's not um it's not like a goal we're going to reach at the end of 2020. Like this is, this is work that we need to be doing on ourselves, um, ongoing. And before, before I shut up and I give the mic over to you, I just want to say, um, I have had some women of color that have recorded with me recently, and I asked them these questions. What should we do to be uh, being good allies? And I I realized that I need to stop asking all of my friends of color uh, to tell me what they need. I mean, that's not true. Let me rephrase that. I need to make sure that the conversations that I'm having, the work that I'm doing is with other people that need to be doing this work as well. I don't need to be uh, preaching to all of my uh, friends of color, all the work I've been doing, but this is to get people that are in the same boat as you and I, to get them to start thinking about this stuff, or if they're, you know, on the journey like we are, that they continue to think about these things. So, um, yeah, that's a lot. I just I just threw a lot out there, but I'd like you to please t- take over the microphone. Tell us about yourself and um, who you are, what you do, all that good stuff. Sure. Like you said earlier, my name is Jamie. I am the host of First Do No Harm podcast. It was a podcast really to spread more human kindness out into the world, to go from a place of understanding. And part of that during this year, and it hasn't just been this year, but it's gotten a lot louder, has been the issues that people of color are experiencing 
across the board. And you don't have to look very far to find someone in pain, someone who's hurting, someone who's terrified. And this, like I said, it's not something new. It's something that Black women have been educating their children on that you and I probably didn't get the same type of education on how to navigate through the constructs of our society in the United States of America. We haven't had the same instruction when we were growing up about how to deal with police, about how to deal when we go shopping. So all of that really caused me, I started doing interviews for a mini series through the lens of Black Lives Matter because there's no way for us to know as white individuals. There's no way for us to comprehend what's going on or to imagine it. But I wanted to be able to take away the imagination, to be able to give voice to the people who are feeling these things so that we can understand more. And, and by understanding, we're going to work harder for those people. We're gonna, we are going to be better. We're going to push for a better society and culture. And part of that, not just the mini series, um, I've also been, um, I started doing when Brianna Taylor was murdered, when she was killed in that whole situation, I um, really wanted to find a way that people felt like they were being heard, that we were just as enraged in the brutality that was going on. And so I started doing art um, which was very new to me uh, during the pandemic. And so like I took these pieces of newspaper that actually had these officers and the stories of all the brutality and all the racism going on and I burnt them and I charred them and I turned it into the fist that is known for the Black Lives Matter movement and auctioned it off and donated that money to the NAACP. So that's, that's part of what we're doing. And my, I have a great friend who is a physician here in my town in North Carolina. And he and I started a diversity training at his spot hospital, uh, more of a book club. And our first book was Waking Up White. And it was very informative of how, like you and I are talking, to go from being the people of privilege and to recognize and to do better. So that's kind of what's been going on over the last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot has happened. And, you know, this is, uh, we're not going to summarize and cover everything that's happened, but we've watched uh, people basically be lynched in the streets on TV. We've um, watched no punishment befall any of these people in mm -hmm. power. We are seeing ongoing uh, uh, policy that, specifically disenfranchises the already disenfranchised um you know looking at the way our uh, elections are playing out even today we see that the people that are representing us do not represent us and i live in a state i live in a blue dot in a red state and it's really hard to know that all the people around me I shouldn't say all the people around me, that a lot of the people that surround me in this place that I live and I call home have these ideas that are so rooted in hatred and the thought that those different from them are less than, deserve less than, that they have earned the negative things that have befallen them. There's all this rhetoric that I've gotten really quiet because I'm starting to feel kind of just, I mean, it, you know, a lot of us are just now being called to this. We're just realizing how disgusting and pervasive and um, damaging this is. And uh, this, this isn't new. What, you know, like 18 generations of people, uh, never ever being allowed to to get ahead uh it, it's really sickening and it's all kind of upheld by the system that was built to benefit off of racism and we continue to live in a society that was built on the scaffolding of racism so i mean even think about it adrian we're we're here day after election we're right in the middle of it women 
have celebrated. This was 100 years for us to have the ability to vote, Mm -hmm. but not black women. They didn't get the same right until 1964. Mm -hmm. I mean, 46 years. My my mom was 11 then. So Mm -hmm. that's not, I mean, this, this was minutes ago in the grand scheme of exactly. Um, And we're, uh, we're in a place where black women still don't get to vote un unencumbered uh, Mm -hmm. without harassment, without uh, voter ID laws and um, intimidation at the polls. Mm -hmm. Like there's all this shit that happens that um, we think, oh, well, everybody has the right to vote. You know what? (laughs) I even think about something as simple as like when I caucus, my caucus location, if you didn't have a car and plenty of gas in your tank, my caucus was like, caucus location was up on the other side of the fucking interstate. So you want to talk about making it difficult. Like there was no bus that ran up there. It was at a time of night that definitely no buses were running up there. So just all these little things that you don't think of that just make it that much fucking harder Mm -hmm. to access the things that are your rights. Yeah, it's your right to vote, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be able to get off work, get your kids taken care of, get there. I mean, why, why is our, I mean, this is a whole separate issue, but why is election day not a national holiday? Why don't we make it every Every single person why don't we make it so that when you like you know we make 18 year old boys sign up for the um you know potential draft uh draft cards or whatever but we don't sign people up to vote like also you know doug and i've talked about this before as well I can do everything I need to do for my life. I can get medical test results I can pay my bills I can uh you know, check my nursing license. There are all these things that I can do online. I can order things to be delivered across the country in a matter of two days, but they can't figure out a way that you can vote on your phone. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. I can, I can access my student loans, my tax records. I can do all that from my phone. Can't. So anyway, there are all these things that we think of as being rights. Like you said, um, not everybody has their rights intact and protected. And I think until like what you're doing right now, I think until we start sharing that information, because realistically, people of color, they know it. It's not a secret to them. Right. But for us, we have no idea. There was so much that I had such blinders on that were planted inside of me. I mean, unintentionally, but like, we should be outraged, but that's, that's why we are now making the effort to put this information out to people who are white, who are men, who are women, who don't feel the oppression that our, our friends do who are of color. Yeah. And I think that, um, the burden absolutely has to be on us and each other. We need to be having these conversations. Mm -hmm. That's kind of why we're here today. This is not for us to parade what we've done or what we've learned. This is for us to have this conversation, to incite these conversations around other, uh, among other white women Mm -hmm. and, and white men as well, because they even, even, you know, as much, if not more so need to be part of this conversation. Absolutely. Um, And I think that we need to also remember that we are going to fuck up Mm -hmm. and we are going to sometimes not realize it. And when we get called out on it, we need, you know, we need to accept that this is an ongoing practice. You know, I heard someone talking about how um, when you want to lose weight, you don't get on a treadmill once. And so when you want to change a set of behaviors, beliefs, whatever, you don't just do something about it once. And so... Um, I think that, you know, I want to remind people that what I'm doing, the things that I'm trying to do, could I be doing more? Yes. Should I be doing more? Yes. Am I going to work to do more every day? Yes. But what I do is not the same, shouldn't, doesn't need to look the same as what someone else does. You know, we need to be educating ourselves. The reading already exists. Black leaders are already speaking on these topics. We have access to this information. So we need to be um, not only seeking out this information, but then believing what people are telling us. And I think that a lot of the people that have so much, 
I, you know, I say things like a lot of the people, I think it's an overwhelming fact that you hate what you don't know, or you hate what you misunderstand. And I think that myself as a resident of the state of Iowa, in a blue dot in a red state, I think that there are just a lot of people out there that probably have never spent time with any people of color. And if right. they have, it was very short amount of time in a very odd circumstance. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that people that um, aren't exposed to, to diversity and differences, I don't think they're evil people, but I think that you need to challenge those small town ideas. And I'm not picking on people from small towns because there are racists in big cities as well. I just think that when you're not exposed, I grew up and you know, this is not like, oh, look at me, I'm so great. I grew up right outside of Chicago, okay? I saw people from all over the world living in this giant city and figuring it out. There was a lot of crime. There was a lot of great uh, communities as well. And so some of the best friends I ever had don't look like me and don't speak the same language as me as their first language. This, is, this was just reality when I was growing up. So a lot of my bias is that I think of a lot of racism being, you know, very small town, very rural, and it's not. So that's my own bias that I'm constantly working on. And when we talk about things, I have to resist the urge to make those assumptions about people that maybe hold racist ideals. So, so there, live right here on this podcast, I'm learning that I need to watch what I say because it's not always just that. You were with that. I um, I would like to encourage anyone listening to this because you were talking about the books and like the the easy generalizations that sometimes you make from more of a, a smaller town, a different type of community than the big cities. There is a just a couple page paper that was written by a lady named Peggy McIntosh, and the name is White Privilege Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. Because let's be realistic, people, not everybody's going to want to sit down and read a book. Not everyone is going to want to get in their car and pop on an audio book and listen to that instead of like some great jams or, or just be quiet and decompress. But she goes through 40 things that she began realizing and that's very different for her just from being a white woman than it is the people of color. So just like, for example, um, one of the things that she put is, I can be pretty sure that my neighbors in such a location will be neutral or pleasant to me. That's, I mean, that's not even something you and I have to think about. So I would encourage anyone listening because this is a very general, it doesn't matter if you live in the city, it doesn't matter if you live in the country, I guarantee you that you're going to be able to relate and that these are things you've never thought of. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to link, I'll link that in the, in the show description, in the show notes. But um, I guess where this conversation has led me is to recognize that I'm going to continue to make mistakes. And if I notice them, I'm going to stop. I'm going to correct them. There's no shame in learning. If I say something that's horrible and someone says, hey, you know, that's, that's not really cool. You probably shouldn't say that then that's a problem. Or if they get outraged, they're allowed to be outraged yeah, if we say absolutely. things that are incorrect, even and if we didn't know it. And, and you know, when you piss people off, they have the right to remain angry at you. Like, right. They don't have to forgive you if you fuck up. And if you fuck up repeatedly, and if you, you know, if you make a choice to use um, certain types of language or attitudes, I mean, then, you know, then people get to, re you can say what you want, but people get to react how they want as well, mm -hmm. right? Isn't that what they say? So I think that um, for me, the the biggest, the biggest challenge is continuing to grow, continuing to learn, even though I feel like I lived a very diverse childhood, that type of, um, you know, not having a homogenous base of people that you grew up around, that doesn't automatically mean that I don't have racist beliefs. In fact, that probably means that I have even more because, like, for example, um, so I grew up in Cook County, which is like the most populated county in, you know, it's like, like, the center chunk of Chicago outright, even though I did not live in Chicago. I lived in Melrose Park, 
which is like 30 minutes west of the downtown Chicago Loop. And the high school that was in my public school district was a primarily black high school. And I, because of a number of different reasons, went to a private Catholic high school that cost several thousand dollars a year that my, you know, my, my parents are not wealthy. They struggled to do that, but they sent me to this school because they thought I would be less exposed to violence, get a better education, that sort of thing. So here I think my parents, you know, and I do, I love my parents. They did everything they could to give me the education that I needed to, you know, be the nurse that I am today. But I also recognize that, you know, as, as cool as I think I am living in Chicago, that um, I still was trying to escape something that was left for this entire community of people. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, well, I don't want, I, I, I want a better education than that. I want a safer education than that. But it's like, well, but then how about instead of working, to set, working so hard to send me to a private school, how come there weren't parents that were working to make that school better? how are the district lines drawn? How is funding being mm -hmm. you know, done? How are teachers being prepared? How are students being protected and supported? So right there, I recognize that like, you know, where you grow up doesn't always mean that you are devoid of, of racist ideas, beliefs, ref, re, uh, reflexes, even if it's not something that you've consciously decided on, we all have these like reflexes. Um, so that's been the, the biggest challenge for me. And I've tried to consume a lot of media from people who know, you know, people that are um, educators, political leaders, um, making sure that I'm, um, that I'm getting my education from the people who can tell me the truth, you know? Mm -hmm. right. There's so much content. There's so much out there. Um, this isn't news. Like, uh, you know, I can uh, link a list of books in the description, but these, these it, links exist. Like there are plenty of lists. You can Google it. You can find plenty of stuff to read. Um, but I, I still think that like the, the things that I have chosen to read are the things that interest me, you know, reading, for example, from um, black female authors um, that, of course, that's not all I'm reading, um, but those are the things that interest me the most right now because I want to hear female voices in this movement. Um, there's all sorts of choices out there. There's a million different Instagram accounts, books, magazines, web articles, blogs. Um, I think that, uh, where am I going with this? I'm rambling. I, I just, I think there's a lot of content out there that you don't need to limit yourself into only reading like the top five books, you know, like only reading White Supremacy and Me or How to Be an Anti-Racist. These are great, important books, but that's not all there is. There's so much out there. Um, even classic literature, you know, read some like Alice mm. Walker, read- some, Raisin in the Sun. Yeah, like, you know, because these, um, by nature of being written by black authors are a snapshot of what they were experiencing. What do writers write? They write what they know. And so um, even if these are not uh, nonfiction books written in 2020, there's still a lot to be learned from mm -hmm. this, from these works. That's why they, that's why they stand up and that's why they still exist because they're such important works. Um, so let's, let's redirect this. Cause I'm getting, I'm getting rambly here. I think, the coffee is not having the desired effect. I think it's <laughs> a little less less put together, but let's talk about. Um, so you've you've done this series of episodes. Um, you know you've had the discussion on the forefront of your social media. Mm -hmm. um, you've been doing this art. Um, I think that there are lots of things that we can say that we're doing, but. Um, I don't know what else. What what are some things that you maybe have wanted to do that you have not yet done? And I'm going to drink some more coffee. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I really want to get more into the community. It's really hard with the pandemic and everything going on. Mm -hmm. But yesterday, I volunteered as a poll observer for the DNC, and I was 
the people that I worked with, they were part of the NAACP. Um, so I actually think that I'm going to sign up to be a part of that. They want to know more about healthcare and they want someone that's like on their board in that area that has more insight. But like I, I recognize too, you and I as a nurse, um, I didn't say that earlier, but I work in rapid response now. My history for the last decade was in neuro ICU, but as nurses in the middle of healthcare, we know the demographics of people who are dying the most of COVID-19, and they are people of color. They are the people who they don't have, I mean, this isn't necessarily people of color, but like those who are lower socioeconomically and they don't have access to their own vehicle. So they're having to get around people who are infected to get to work and things like that. Um, so I would, I would like to figure out how to do more on a larger scale because these things that I have been trying to do, I almost feel sometimes that I'm doing it in vain. I don't know how to, I don't know how to explain that or to, to properly articulate it because I'm doing this and making the art, I'm putting money here, but I'm not... I don't feel like I'm impacting enough. I don't feel like I'm getting to the hearts and to the core of the people who need to be, to feel what I have to offer. You know, like I can make something better. I just don't know how to do it yet. So I've tried with my family. Um, you were talking about how you're from Iowa. I am from the South. I grew up, I was in South Carolina, the lower part of the state until I was 13. And then I lived in Alabama until I was 27. And now I'm here in North Carolina. So the things that I have experienced growing up, um, is just been astounding is very sad. And my family and a lot of the people that I went to school with, they're still like that. And um, one of the things that I've, I have tried to do is not feel uncomfortable in others' discomfort whenever I call them out on things. And I don't do it in a place of meanness because if you're abrasive, chances are you're going to completely shut them out. You're going to turn them off. Yeah. So I try to do it as a very nice way of educating people. I remember one time I posted something about uh, phrases and words that are actually racist that we use. And I had several, several cousins that wrote back to me and they said, I don't understand why that's racist. And so I said, okay, well, this is what I've been told and this is why. And she started arguing with me. Uh, well, I don't think people feel that way. In those situations, it's important to say, well, who, who of color have you asked? I'm, I'm a white woman, and I know from the people that I'm friends with and what they've told me, I'm not necessarily the right person for you to argue with because I can only tell you secondhand information. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just... But also to a point, I think that we, we can Google the, the origins of words. Like these things are documented. They're, it's not like nobody... For but you're example, asking someone to do work that they don't want to do work. They only right. want to fight. So you have to be able to throw very small facts at them. You right. have to do the work for other you people. Can say, you know, and that's just to me, there are certain phrases that I heard my family using growing up. And I've even said to them now, you know, these are just like turn of phrase that are just common in the language used by people that I know and love. And they'll, they'll um, for example, one... Uh, uh, one phrase that people, a lot of people don't know about is uh, when they say like, no comments from the peanut gallery. The peanut yeah. gallery yeah. was the area of the theater where mm -hmm. black people were forced to sit. Yep. Um, and so when you say that, you're literally referencing a racist, like social con, like a thing that people had to do and were bound to. So when people say to me like, well, I don't think that word bothers no, it, it's documented. Like, this happened. You don't get to pretend like it didn't or like you don't understand. And that's where I get into trouble because I'm, I have a difficult time being like, how do you not understand this thing that is right, right here in front of your face? And people are telling you, it's like, um, even down to that simple, like, if, if you hurt my feelings, you don't get to tell me that you didn't. 
if someone tells you that this is racist, you don't get to tell them that it isn't. And that's where people get really touchy because they don't want to be told what to do. They don't want to be told what to think. And they uh, may or may not take what you, and even if they take what you say as truth, they may not care. And that's the, that's the problem that I run into is when you have people that are like, yeah, I'm going to still do it and say it. So thanks for letting me know. But mm, cause I've had people say that to mm-hmm. me like, yeah, well, I'm, I still use that phrase. Okay. Well, I'm just telling you that that's shitty. Now I do have a couple people that are close friends and, and I think that the other problem that we have people who want to be more aware of what's going on, why people are feeling the way they're feeling, yada, yada, yada. I've listened to multiple podcasts with Black Americans that they were discussing. um, They're just so tired of having to do all the education. Just like you're saying, we can look it up, we can find it out. But I do have two people who are always happy to answer questions. So when I have someone come at me, I typically make a post like the one that I was just telling you about. There were like four or five phrases, like, I don't know, all lives matter and why that is so offensive. And I tag them in it and then they come back and they answer the question. So they don't even have to search for a person that they know who's of color. Like I provide them so that they have, they are willing to have nice and open dialogue. So I think that's also a great resource to have, but it's not anyone else's responsibility to figure out what's going on or why it's going on as far as like, it's not the responsibility of the people who we have been oppressing for all of these years who are currently suffering. That's, they don't owe that to us. We owe to them, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. To, which is why we need to be having these conversations where yes. we're exploring and examining and fessing up to the shit that we've done that's wrong. Um, and the things that we, you know, it's like, um, uh, if you, uh, if you tell someone you're not going to do a certain thing, cause it bugs them. Okay. I, I t- I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to leave the cap off the toothpaste anymore because it bothers you. It doesn't matter why it bothers you. Mm-hmm. You've asked me not to do that. So I either make the choice to respect your wishes or not. <laughs> and so I think that, um, some people just flat out refuse to put the toothpaste cap back on, even though they understand uh, that it it's your request. I mean, maybe that's a terrible metaphor. I think some people do flat out refuse, and those are the people that um, I find most frustrating. Um, I try to remember to have my focus on people that are interested in having those discussions. You can't fight with a brick wall. And even when you're trying to maybe sway someone um, who believes, who isn't willing to do the work, um, I think that you need, my method of being angry (laughs) and wanting to tell people why their reasoning is stupid is not always the best and will cause people to shut down instead Mm -hmm. of open up. So that's the thing that I have to work on is appealing to people and what what they believe in rather than trying to tell them that what they believe is wrong. Um, And I think that it's important too, for us to realize you and I are, I think that it's, it is more rare than prominent that people are able to reflect and say, you know what, this isn't okay. Um, This is not, it's not okay for me, not even putting the blame elsewhere, but saying I was wrong. I did something that was not appropriate And that's a very difficult thing for the general population. A lot of people don't have that type of security in themselves. So when you talk about racism, when you talk about privilege with white Americans, when you throw out the word racism, racist, that is, it's a good, bad binary is how our mind works. So when you say, hey, this action that you are doing it's actually very racist for you to do that. They think, oh my gosh, you're telling me I'm a horrible person. You're not, it is not going to be easy to dismantle people's reflection or their, the ways that they see their actions if you make them feel like they are actually a bad person because of it. So it's a very 
if we want to make an impact, if we want to make a difference and for more people to become aware, we have to show that it's not, it's not always black and white. And it doesn't mean that we are horrible people for the horrible things that we have done, even us, um, and that we continue to do unknowingly. But once you know that these things do affect people, once you can share gently, um, you know, if somebody's not trying to be an asshole, then you can go about a little bit easier um, of why it is a racist thing. Then I think that that things can change a little bit more. Mm-hmm. You know, like the terminology and the way that we talk to people who are just not super secure in their privilege. Um, it has to be very carefully navigated. Yeah. And (laughs) I will continue to fight the desire to just. Me too. Me too. (laughs) Me too. Because for me, it is, it is so obvious and it is, um, Mm -hmm. it's, um, you just have to listen. And I think that it's a lot of, it's difficult for people to listen, especially with our current state of the media and it's oh, really yeah. incredibly difficult to um, navigate a, a legitimate source from a non-legitimate source. It's, you know, people, I don't think from the time that we're in elementary school, high school, we're not taught how to recognize um you know, going through university, you know, they drilled it into our heads how to uh, determine a reliable source, an unbiased source. Not everybody gets that education. No. And so, especially with all of the um, satirical media, fake news, um, people that share things because a headline uh, caught their eye and not because they read the article, there are a lot of problems working against us. So I think that in as much as possible, those of us that have any kind of platform, you, mm-hmm. I, other podcasters, people on social media, we need to be continuing to have these conversations because like I've said several times, we're not here to come about with solutions. We're not here to tout how wonderful we're doing. We're just here to normalize the conversation, um, the ongoing conversation that needs to happen for any kind of change to occur. And there are a few things that I also believe that I kind of want to talk about. And I kind of want to look at my list here because um, I don't want to miss some things because it's really easy for me to wander all over because there's so much in my head about this topic that I have yet. But you have so much good information before. though. So Thank like you, well, you feel like I'm you're listening. wandering, but I'm just like eating up what you have to say and offer. So, and you know, none of this is, thank you. I appreciate you saying that. I'm glad that this is coming through as more than just me. Like, absolutely. But I also want to remind people that like, this is not my, um, individual, my, my own thoughts that I birthed from my mind. I'm listening to people. I'm listening. Like, for example, here, I want to, um, now, there are so many resources, and um, I, I'm just going to scratch the tip of a few, but I just want to talk about a few different accounts that I follow on Instagram that I really, really enjoy for the content um, that they provide. The number one that I love um, following on Instagram is Privilege to Progress. Not only do they post on the regular old Instagram feed, but they're constantly doing interviews and discussions about all sorts of topics. So that is, uh, I think their Priv to Prague is their screen name. They're fantastic. I also follow um, authors, you know, like, for example, I think everybody knows who um, Ibram X. Kendi is right now. He's a professor. He's an author. He has many books. And so um, I follow him. I follow Danielle Koch. She is at Oh Happy Danny on Instagram. She has loads of great information. And actually, this is a new account that I started following. I didn't know about her until a few weeks ago. I've been following Sophia Rowe. Um, She has tons of great content on Um, IGTV about like I just right before we came on to talk about this I watched her video about um, white saviorhood versus white allyship and how we have to be really careful that we're not just standing on these podiums patting ourselves on the back for all the work we've been doing no we um, we need to be learning from um, 
I, like I said, she's got tons of great videos. I also follow Erica Hart. Um, and she, you know, she makes me feel uncomfortable sometimes. And I think I've grown because of that, because she is not afraid to talk about the true bullshit that happens when white people aren't willing to do the work. And I don't want to frame it like that because she's actually a really positive voice. She's not just someone that makes us, um, feel apologetic for all the shit that that exists in our country but i think you should check her out she's at i heart erica i h a r t erica of course i follow um black women leaders in nursing uh black nurses killing it there's all these amazing accounts that you can follow that feature and normalize black people doing good stuff achievements you know an entire family of medical doctors we need to normalize seeing these things, not just in the lens of like, let's work on getting better at not being racist, but in the means of like, let's stop seeing people of color as these like token, uh, you know, representatives of stereotype in our society. So I encourage people to like, get on Insta and deep dive people's like, if you find an account that you really like, um, you know, deep dive who they follow or who follows them um, and really start exposing yourself more and more to people that are giving, they're freely giving you this information. You don't have to bother any of your exhausted friends of color. You can just go to the people that are already giving you this information. And for me, we're all already scrolling on Instagram. Why not learn something while you're there? So that's kind of my spiel on Instagram and how that has become my main mode of consuming lately because <laughs> I can't I can't stand Facebook right now. Same. TikTok is also a great place. Uh, I know that a lot of people discovered TikTok uh, in the midst of the pandemic. Mm-hmm. But TikTok, the hashtag BLM, if you, the algorithm, if you just like a couple of the posts that are about it, I have learned so much through that app. Just like you said, through the people who are like pointing out blatant things and opening my eyes even more so that I can change and I can be better to make someone's life just a little bit easier. Um, So that's another recommendation if you just have a happy finger that you enjoy scrolling and you get tired of Instagram, TikTok is another great place to go to find information on that. Hashtag social media for some Yeah, right? Well, it's great. It's right here at our fingertips. Why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Also, some other things I'm just, I've I've written down some lists. One more list I want to roll through real fast here Um, and then... We're going to have to continue this in another episode because we're starting to get long in the wind here. But um, I want to talk about some things that I've learned during this movement. And I think you'd probably agree. And we've already talked about some of these things, but I just want to run through this list real quick. Um, First thing on the list is I have uh, listen when people of color talk believe their experiences. This is not one big conspiracy to make you believe some shit that isn't true. Listen to people, listen to their stories, believe them. um, Because uh, if you want to learn who better than to listen to people that are already telling these stories. Um, Two, kind of like I said, amplify black voices, which is not just, hey, have a podcast and have people on your podcast. That includes tagging people when you share things in Instagram stories, making sure that you're not uh, taking screen shares of people's work, including their intellectual content, and then passing it off as your own or without credit on social media. So make sure that you are Um, crediting people for their content and their thoughts. I also think that we should be um, buying products, buying books. I have been listening to How to Be Anti-Racist as an ebook because I can I I can consume faster and better by listening. That's just me. But I still bought the hardback book. Me too. Me too. So things like this, you need to make sure that you're amplifying voices and also um, don't just, you know, the public library is great, support your local public library, but also 
get some money to these people that are educating you for free, basically. Well, you know, if you go to the library, they're educating you for free. Um, also, uh, number, what is this? Number three, speak when you witness injustice and see, and if you see a space to educate. So, Can you please repeat that about 10 more times? <laughs> Let's just put that on like a continuous loop for a few minutes. Yes. Absolutely. Speak when you see injustice. You as a, uh, not, I mean, I mean, you say you, I, as a white woman, might get some heat for stepping in, you know? Likely. Likely. However, I'm less likely to be murdered for Mm -hmm. stepping in and asking somebody to not be um, a proprietor of injustice. So um, if this means, you know, if you feel safe, stop, record police interactions that look shitty to you all the way through to um, when you're sitting around, you know, Thanksgiving dinner with your household, because you should be social distancing and not eating Thanksgiving dinner with a whole bunch of people that you don't live with. But while you're having those Thanksgiving discussions and grandma, Aunt Ruth, Uncle Joe, whoever it is, says something that's racist, call it out. Doesn't mean you have to be aggressive, but you can say, hey, I don't get that, that, that joke that everybody's laughing at. Can you explain that to me? Can you explain why that's funny? You don't have to be an asshole about it, but you can challenge those things that are said around the dinner table know your audience i'm not telling you to start world war ii but um i don't know if if one of my family members said something racist i'd have a hard time not just like flinging the mashed potatoes do you want to come to my thanksgiving i mean we're not really having it but one year you should come down and just enjoy a thanksgiving meal here let's not talk about the family members that (laughs) i don't have contact with because Mm -hmm. of the the fundamental beliefs differences and beliefs we have about human beings so um that's just me i'm not saying everybody has to disown their family but sure um, well genetics for me are not a reason to put up with hateful people well even that's that's my dad who's absolutely i would love him he's a wonderful person um the town that I live in is Greensboro, North Carolina, and in Greensboro, we have the International Civil Rights Museum, which I've been to multiple times, cried my eyes out every time, but my dad has a different idea and maybe even memory of the whole civil rights movement because he was alive during that time. So when the pandemic's over, I asked him the other day when we were having a very uncomfortable but a very respectful conversation about race, um, I asked him, I was like, hey, would you be willing to go to this museum with me and walk through it? I want you to tell me if you remember these things, if you can add any more to this story. Like, I would love to have your insight on it too. So even if it's not like, hey, don't be a shitty person, which I think is a great way to go about it for 99% of it. But, you know, like if you can bring them into seeing things like that, like there's those are great ways too, I think, with with being able to stand up in a different manner to change their exposure. Sometimes maybe you need to hold their hand while you go through it together. And then all of a sudden they realize that things are very different from the way they remembered it. That's how the brain works. Yeah. And I think that um, those discussions, though difficult, can be small and uh, I think of the 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 act of water eroding away at stone. You may not knock knock hateful racist ideas out of you know Grandpa Joe with one conversation, but maybe with repeated um, discussion, like you said, being on having a respectful conversation in which you disagree. It is possible to do. Um, it's hard for me. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> that I work on all the time. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that's, you got, like I said, you got to know your audience. So if it's your family and you know when they might be most receptive, um, like obviously you don't talk to them when they're aggravated about something else already. But if you know when you can have these conversations, I encourage people to work up the nerve to have them because that mm-hmm. can be, um, that can be, the the continuous erosion that really changes people's hearts and the way they they behave and the way they believe so um 
And remember, I love the I love the quote when people talk about their grandparents because I say this to my mom when she talks about her father. If my grandfather can figure out how to work a smartphone at 86 years old, you can realize that the things that you do are racist and you can they can learn that too. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let's we we don't need to give them a pass either just because they're the older generation and that's not okay for us to do either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we all have the capacity to learn and grow and we need to hold ourselves accountable for that and to help each other learn and grow. Mm -hmm. If you know that your family member is trying, but they're struggling, maybe they do need a, a little bit of help from you. So yeah, recognize when those conversations can be had. Um, I also think like like we said at the beginning, we're recording this on election day. I think another thing that's very important is not just, obviously we've all already cast our, vote, our votes for this election, but people need to be voting in every election. Even mm -hmm. if you don't really give a shit about your local elections, those are the ones that affect you the most directly. Um, Doug was watching a YouTube video the other day and it was, um, a, a black man talking about why he didn't vote. And he said, because in my neighborhood, nothing changes. It doesn't matter who's in the White House, doesn't matter who's at the governor's office, nothing in my neighborhood ever changes. And to that, the person interviewing him said, well, then, you know, you need to be voting on propositions. You need to be voting on your school board. You need to be voting on your city council. Um, you need to be you know, signing those petitions, whatever, whatever it is you can do, maybe you need to be more at a local level. I know a lot of people feel disempowered and feel like voting doesn't do shit. And some people like we've already established, it's not just that easy for them to go stand in line for hours after being at work all day. Um, there's so much more to it that needs to be fixed. But those of us that do have the ability to vote, we need to vote locally in every election. I tell people who said, well, even if you don't have a kid in school, if you'd like to live in a community that's not made up of morons, you do need to care about your school board elections because it does affect you. Um, and then, um, you know, last but not least, I think is um, always, always, always remember that as long as you are continuing to learn and grow, there's no set like quota that you have to hit. There's no set amount of donations you need to make or uh, petitions you need to sign but you need to recognize that for some people they don't get to put it down like you said they don't have the privilege to turn off the news and walk away because the communities they live in and the ways they live their lives are so affected down to everything they do that they don't they don't get to ignore these issues so if you're listening and you are someone that has the uh, privilege in the past to look away. I encourage you not to do that. I encourage you to check out all of these resources that we've been talking about and continue to listen to other podcasters that are talking about this. Jamie, I know you've got all these episodes on your channel. Would you like to tell people how they can find your episodes, uh, not just your episodes dealing with this subject matter, but all of your episodes? Oh yeah, I'm on um, all major platforms for podcasts. So, you know, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Anchor. So that's it, first do no harm. Also, I'm on Instagram at first do no harm podcast, but there's periods all in between those words. So other than that, yeah. I'll throw it up on the screen so okay. people can see it. Um, yeah. So I think maybe we should call this discussion here, but knowing that this discussion is not over and won't be over, um, both between the two of us, as well as between ourselves and, you know. The people that we interact with so thanks for having an uncomfortable conversation with me yeah and i i really appreciate all of the people who are listening to this too like not only do i enjoy having someone that is a safe space for discomfort that we can point out how we are very human and our failures per se but I mean, people listening to this too, it has to be uncomfortable, but I just, I want to encourage all of your listeners to do something about it in the capacity that they can, because any little bit of effort that you put into it, it does make a difference. Even if you don't feel like it does, it makes a difference to someone. Absolutely. 
Well, thank you so much thank Judy, you. for joining me. It's always a pleasure to interact with you, whether it's on a show or in text or whatever. So I'm sure we'll do it again. And then everybody, you already know, nursinguncensored.com exists. And I have started, I never talk about the website. So I'm gonna talk about the website for just a second because I, I do, I have a lot of traffic to the website, but I wanna make sure all of you know what's there. So I always say, hey, we got the podcast, the vlog, the blog. I have been blogging more. I have had some guest bloggers as well that have been writing content. Oh, that's um, really cool. Yeah. What a so, great idea. Yes. I'm very excited about that. So, so far I've had blog posts about uh, study tips, science-based study tips for nurses, um, had a CRNA talk about how to be a competitive student for CRNA school. I've started adding, it's, it's at the very early stages, but I've started adding transcripts to the web pages for all of my newest content. It would take me a million years to go back and do every episode. But from here on out, I'm doing transcripts so that if people don't want to listen or they want to cruise, um, you know, what we've talked about in text, there's that. Um, but yeah, there's tons of content. Um, I've been working on making sure if people are watching this interview in video form, then you already know I've been working to get more and more videos out in video form because people love looking at our shining faces when we're talking about all this stuff. So please check out nursinguncenter.com, share it with your friends uh, because there's, I've been, I've been writing a lot of stuff over there. So yeah, please check that out. And um, also, uh, what, what do I always say? Happy nursing. 